Howdy. This video is on buffers and acid base indicators. Buffers are used to help maintain a relatively constant pH. Buffers are essential in most biological systems. Acid base indicators are used in acid base titrations to determine the endpoint. After watching this video, you should be able to write down the reaction and determine the acid constant for a buffer consuming acid or base. You should be able to describe how to make a buffer solution for a specific pH, and you should be able to determine the best indicator for a titration. You should be able to describe how buffers and indicators are composed of weak acid and kajic base, and you should relate buffers and indicators to the henderson hasselbalch equation. So the henderson hasselbalch equation, we have pH equals pKa plus log base over acid. Now notice that this is, these concentrations are the initial concentrations. Also notice for this fraction, you could also do moles of base over moles of acid. Now if the concentration of the kajic base equals the concentration of the acid, then this fraction is equal to 1, log of 1 is 0, and the pH is equal to pKa. So buffers are composed of weak acid and conjugate base. Buffers are optimal when the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the acid, which would mean the pH equals the pKa. And so if you're going to try and make a buffer with a specific pH, you try to find an acid that has a pKa close to the pH that you're trying to make the buffer for. Acid base indicators are composed of weak acid and conjugate base of different colors, and they change color approximately when the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the acid. And so you try to choose an indicator that has a pKa of the acid close to where the um, endpoint will be in terms of pH. And so buffers resist pH change when small amounts of acid or base are added. And so again, it's just going to be a weak acid plus conjugate base. So HF and F minus, dihydrogen phosphate and hydrogen phosphate, the ammonium ion and ammonia, these all can form buffer solutions. You just need a weak acid and its conjugate base. Now, when carbon dioxide reacts with water, we can form carbonic acid, which is an acid. Now, if carbonic acid loses its hydrogen ion, then it forms the bicarbonate. And so a carbonic acid and the bicarbonate can actually form a buffer solution. And so this buffer is actually essential for controlling blood pH. You could also again form a buffer with HF and F minus. And so the hydroxide would be consumed by HF forming water plus F minus. The, any added hydronium ion or hydrogen ion would be consumed by F minus forming HF and H2O. And so if we look at this reaction, we have hydroxide as a reactant. And so that means that the acid constant is going to be 1 over Kb of F minus. Now, Kb of F minus is very small. 1 over Kb is going to be very large. And so you can actually treat this reaction as if it goes to completion. For this reaction, we have hydronium ion as reactant. So that makes us think about 1 over Ka of HF. HF is a weak acid, so its Ka is small, and so 1 over Ka is going to be very large. And so again, you can think about this reaction as going to completion, and pretty much all the added hydronium ion is going to be consumed. And so again, HF going to hydronium plus fluorodons, acum constant here is the Ka of HF. And again, we can write it two ways. We can write it as it just falling apart. Or you can write it as water plus HF going to hydronium ion and F minus. These are equivalent because remember, pure solids, pure liquids do not appear in the ECM expression, and hydronion and hydronium ions are exactly the same. Now, if we flip these reactions, so now we have hydronion as a reactant, F minus as a reactant, HF as product. If you flip the reaction, you take the inverse of the Ekman constant. So Ekman constant for this reaction is 1.6 times 10 to the third. Again, it's really pretty large. And so you can consider that reaction as going to completion. And so here we have um, F minus plus water going to OH minus plus HF. And so that's the KB of F minus. It's really pretty small. Now, typically this is not in a table. And so you have to determine Kb of F minus from the Ka of HF. And so Kb of F minus is 1.6 times n minus 11. It's just Kw over Ka. Remember, for a conjugate acid base pair, Ka times Kb equals Kw. Now, for a buffer, what's happening is the hydroxide will be consumed by the weak acid HF, forming water plus F minus. 
Now we took this top reaction and we flipped it. So we take the inverse of the Ekman constant. And so the Ekman constant for this reaction is 6.3 times 10 to the 10th. It's really, really large. And so you can assume that that reaction goes to completion and pretty much any added hydroxide is going to be completely consumed. And so we have four reactions here. So we have HF going to F minus. So that's the Ka of HF. Here we have flipped that reaction. And so hydronium ion plus F minus goes water plus HF. This would be one over Ka. We, here we have F minus plus water going to OH minus plus HF. And so this is going to be the Kb of F minus. And again, remember Kb equals Kw over Ka. And then here, this is flipped of that one above there. And so this is one over Kb of F minus. And so all four of these reactions are actually related to the Ka of HF. Given Ekman constant for one of those four, you should actually be able to determine the Ekman constant for the other three. And so Ka and Kb of weak acids and their conjugate bases are really pretty small. And so this is the Ka of HF. This is the Kb of F minus. One over Ka of HF and one over Kb of F minus are really pretty large. And so you can think about those reactions as going to completion. And so please remember at, at equilibrium, there'll be mostly the weaker acid and weaker base. And so if we look at say this top one here, here you have hydronium ion, and so that's pretty strong. And so we should have mostly reactants for this top equilibrium. Here, hydronium ion versus HF, this is the weaker acid. And so we'd have mostly products for that equilibrium. The conjugate base of a buffer reacts with the added hydron ions. The weak acid and buffer reacts with the added hydroxide ions. And again, those Ekman constants are really pretty large, so you can consider them to go to completion. So if the Ka of weak acid is 10 to the fourth, what are the values of the Ekman constant for the following? And so the Ekman constant for this reaction is just the Ka of HA, and so that would be 10 to minus four. For this one, the second reaction is just the top reaction written backwards. And so the Ekman constant here is going to be 1 over Ka, and so that would be 10 to the 4th. Now for this one here, we have the OH minus, and so that's going to be a Kb. It's Kb of A minus, and so Kb equals Kw over Ka. So 10 to the minus 14th divided by 10 to the minus 4th, and so the minus 4 is canceled. That gives you 10 to the 10th, minus 10, sorry. And then this one, you have hydroxide HA, hydroxide HA. So this one is this one written backwards. So if we take the inverse of 10 to minus 10, that should give us 10 to the 10. And so again, all four of these are related. And given one, you should be able to determine the other three. And so buffer solutions resist the change in pH when either acid or base is added. And so here we have HCl is added to water and the pH goes from 6.29 to 1.8. The pH of a beaker of ordinary tap water is 6.29, slightly acidic because small amounts of carbon dioxide are dissolved in it. When we add a 0.1 molar solution of hydrochloric acid to the beaker, the water shows a large change in pH. Water is not a buffered solution. Now here we have exactly the same amount of initial volume and we'll add exactly the same amount of HCl at the same concentration, but here we have a buffer solution. And so we'll see that the pH goes from 6.92 to 6.72. In the beaker is a mixture of dissolved dihydrogen phosphate ion and its conjugate base, hydrogen phosphate ion. The solution has a pH of 6.92. We add 10 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of hydrochloric acid, which causes only a small decrease in pH to 6.72. The solution is said to be buffered by the conjugate pair. This phosphate buffer system is found in the kidneys and helps to regulate blood pH. And so the dihydrogen phosphate is the weak acid. The hydrogen phosphate is the conjugate base. It will react with, with the added HCl. Now it consumes most of it, but not all of it. And so the pH will change a little bit. The buffer solutions resist uh, change in pH, but it can't stop the change in pH.
And so here we have the pH as a function of HCl added. And so for the buffer system, we see that the pH changed gradually. For the water, it drops precipitously. Now buffer can be formed by a weak acid plus conjugate base, and there's three reactions that you can actually get to the buffer. Now the first one's not really a reaction. If you have a weak acid, so CO2 is the COO. So if you add the weak acid plus the conjugate base, sodium acetate, then you get a weak acid conjugate base. There's really no reaction. We're just mixing the weak acid with the conjugate base. We could react some of the weak acid with a strong base. So here's our weak acid, here's our strong base, and that will give us the conjugate base and water. As long as we don't consume all of the weak acid, we will get a buffer solution. Here we can react some of the weak base with a strong acid, so hydronines or hydronamines, and that will give us the conjugate acid. And so as long as we don't consume all of our weak base, we'll end up with both the acid base conjugate pair, and so that will give us a buffer solution. And so adding weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base, there is no reaction. But as long as we end up with both weak acid conjugate base, we get a, a buffer solution. The sodium acetate is actually just present as the sodium ions and the acetate ions. Reacting some of a weak acid with a strong base, we can actually get a buffer. Now, if we look at the Eckham constant here, notice we have hydroxide as a reactant. So that's going to be a 1 over Kb of that. And so the Kb of acetate ion is going to be very small. So 1 over Kb should be very large. And so we should be able to consider this reaction to go to completion. And so you can imagine if we have one mole of acetic acid, one mole sodium hydroxide. And initially so we have one mole and one mole. Now this reaction should go to completion. And so we'll actually we'll end up with zero of the acetic acid and zero hydroxide, and so no buffer will form. If we start with one mole of acetic acid, 0.5 moles of hydroxide, again, remember the second constant is really large, so you can consider it goes to completion. And so for this one, we'd say the hydroxide was a limiting reagent, so we'll run out of it before we run out of the acetic acid. So at equilibrium, we should have about half a mole of acetic acid, half a mole of acetate ion. And so we have our weak acid, we have our conjugate base, so we have a buffer solution. Now these do not have to be equal concentrations. We just have to have some of the weak acid and some of the conjugate base. So if we have half a mole of acetic acid, one mole of hydroxide initially, now again, the reaction goes to completion. In this case, the acetic acid is limiting reagent, and so we run out of it first. And so we'll end up with half a mole of hydroxide ion and half a mole of acetate ion. We don't have any of the weak acid, and so it's not a buffer solution. And so we could also react the conjugate base with a strong acid like H+. Now that constant here is going to be 1 over Ka of acetic acid. Ka of acetic acid is really small, so 1 over Ka is going to be really large. So we can treat this reaction as if it goes to completion. And so if initially we have half a mole of acetate ion, 1 mole of the hydrogen ion. Now the, this reaction should be 1 to 1. So we're going to run out of the acetate ion first. That's our limiting reagent. And so we'll end up with... half a mole of the hydrogen ion and half a mole of acetic acid, and we have no conjugate base, and so there is no buffer. Or we can have one mole of acetate ion, 0.25 moles of hydrogen ion. Now again, this reaction goes to completion. K is very, very large. And so here we'll be left with 0.75 moles of acetate ion, zero hydrogen ions, and 0.25 of acetic acid. And so we have weak acid conjugate base, and so we have a buffer. Again, the concentrations of the weak acid conjugate base do not have to be the same. We just have to have some of each. And so which of the following when added to one mole of hydrofluoric acid will form a buffer solution? So hydrofluoric acid is just HF. 
And so if we add HF to HF, we'll just get more HF. And so A and B is null. Here we have sodium fluoride, which is present as sodium ions and fluoride ions. Fluoride ion is a conjugate base of HF. And so C through E should all be yes. HF is an acid, HCl is an acid, so there's no reaction, no way of getting conjugate base, and so F through G is no. And the HF and sodium hydroxide, an acid to base, they will react. Now, if we do one mole of HF and half a mole of hydroxide, we'll end up with um, some F minus and some HF, and so we'll get a buffer, so a buffer for H, yes. But if we have one mole of sodium hydroxide, one mole of HF, we'll end up with zero HF, and so there would be no buffer solution. And so notice for the sodium fluoride, the concentration doesn't matter because we're just adding weak acid plus its conjugate base. There is no reaction. Here, the concentration does matter because if we add too much sodium hydroxide, we'll consume our weak acid. So which one of the following, when added to one mole of HF, will form a buffer solution. And so again, buffer just has to be composed of a weak acid and its conjugate base. Sodium fluoride is very soluble. And so the fluoride minus ion is the conjugate base of HF. And so the concentration doesn't matter. We'll end up with some HF and some fluoride minus ion. When we act, react the HF with hydroxide ion, we just have to make sure that we don't consume all the HF. So as long as the hydroxide ion initial concentration is less than initial concentration of HF, we should get a buffer solution. And so we can ask which of the following when added to one mole of HCl, hydrochloric acid, will form a buffer solution. And so remember HCl is a strong acid, HF is a weak acid. But HCl plus HF, we would expect no reaction because they're both acids. No way of getting the fluoride minus ion, which is the conjugate base, and so no buffer for those first two. HCl plus sodium fluoride. When you see the sodium fluoride, think about you have sodium ions and fluoride ions. Sodium ions are neutral, so don't worry about it. Fluoride ion is a weak base. Now HCl plus a weak base will form um, HF, and so as long as we don't consume all our sodium fluoride, we will get a buffer. And so one mole of HCl and half a mole of sodium fluoride, we'd consume all the sodium fluoride, so that's not gonna work. One mole of sodium fluoride, one mole of HCl, it's not gonna work, because again, we'd consume all our sodium fluoride. But if we have two moles of sodium fluoride, we're not gonna consume all that fluoride on, and we'll end up with a buffer. HCl plus HCl just gives us more HCl. HCl plus sodium hydroxide, that would give us sodium chloride and water, no buffer solution. And so in this case, the only one we get a buffer is E. And so again, if we have HCl and we react it with F minus, so HCl is gonna be hydronons and chloridons. So we'll just focus on the hydronons. And so if we start with one mole of HCl, one mole of F minus. Now this reaction goes to completion. It's one over Ka of HF. It's very large echelon constant. Notice that we consume both our F minus and H plus, And so we end up with no buffer solution. But if we start with two moles of F minus, one mole of hydronon, H plus would be the limiting reagent. So we'll run out of it. And at equilibrium, we'll have one mole of F minus, one mole of HF. And so that will give us a buffer solution. And so here we have sodium fluoride. And so sodium fluoride and HF, this is going to be just a fluoride minus ion, which is a conjugate base. HF is a weak acid. And so both A and B should give us a buffer solution. Here we'd have just more sodium fluoride. We'd have no weak acid, so no buffer. Sodium fluoride plus HCl, that's a strong acid. And so if we do half a mole of HCl, then we'll end up with fluoride minus ion plus HF. If we do one mole of HCl, we'll consume all our fluoride ion. And so for G, no buffer. And fluoride ion is a weak base, sodium hydroxide, strong base, and so no way of getting our HF.
and so it's just a b and f would give us a buffer solution and so when hf and sodium fluoride is combined there's no reaction but you have a weak acid and the conjugate base again you can just ignore the sodium because it's neutral now f minus plus h plus as long as we don't consume all our F minus, we'll get a buffer solution. And so if we have one mole of fluoridine, half a mole of H plus, the H plus will be limiting reagent. We'll run out of it first. And so we end up with half a mole of fluoridine, half a mole of HF. And so we have weak, out, weak acid and conjugate base. And so we have a buffer solution. And so if you're on buffer solution with a pH of 4.3, which is the best choice for pH? And so again, remember henderson hasselbach equation, when the concentration base equals concentration acid, this fraction is one, log of one is zero. And so we want a acid that has a pKa close to the pH that we're looking for. And so if our pH is 4.3, probably the best choice would be that middle one, um, the acetic acid, acetate ion, um, system would give us a pKa closer a pH. And then what you do is you m modify the um, ratio of base to acid until you get to the pH that you want. And so if we start with anderson hasselbach equation, this is the pH where one was 4.3 or pKa of 4.74 plus log of base over acid. And so if we subtract 4.74 from both sides, we get minus 0.44. Now, if we take everything to the power of 10, that gets rid of that log. And so the ratio of base to acid is equal to 10 to the, to the power of minus 0.44, which is 0.36. And so as long as this ratio is 0.36, then our pH should be 4.3. And so it's kind of interesting, it's the ratio that actually matters not the absolute quantities. So which would be the best choice for a buffer at the pH of seven? And so again, we just need to find one that has a pKa close to that pH. And so that would probably be the dihydrogen phosphate phosphate um, ion situation. So that would be a good choice. And so again, we just choose an acid with a pKa close to the pH we're looking for. And so if we want to try to get that pH to seven, we can start with the anderson hasselbach equation. And so our pH we're trying to get is seven. Our pKa is 7.21. And so plus the log of the base of the acid. And we do the math the same way as last time. And so subtract 7.21 from both sides. And so we get minus 0.21. Take everything to the power of 10. And so as long as the ratio of hydrogen phosphate to dihydrogen phosphate is 0.62, we should get a pH close to seven. A 100 milliliter buffer is 0.1 molar acetic acid and 0.1 molar sodium acetate. Sodium acetate is a salt and completely disassociates to sodium ions and acetate ions. And so we can actually just ignore the acetate ion because it's neutral. And so the acetic acid and the acetate ions give us a buffer. And so what is the pH and pH change resulting from the addition of 10 milliliter of 0.95 molar sodium hydroxide to the buffer solution? Well, so if you look at the Ekman constant for this reaction, we have acetic acid plus hydroxide going to acetate ion plus water. It's gonna be one over Kb of the acetate ion. And so it's gonna be very large. Kb of acetate ion is very small. And so one over Kb of acetate ion is 1.8 times 10 to the ninth. And so we can consider this reaction as going to completion. And so initially we have weak acid conjugate base. And so we can use the henderson hasselbach equation. Remember, because the concentration is moles over a volume, you can also just use moles of base over moles of acid. And sometimes it's easier to use the moles instead of the concentration, especially like in a titration reaction because the, the um, volume will change. And so initial moles of acetic acid is 0 0.01. Initial moles of acetate ion is 0 0.01. And because you had 100 milliliter, initial moles of hydroxide is 0 0.01 times 0 0.95, 0 0.0095. 
And so we start with our acetic acid and react it with 0 0.095 of hydroxide ion. And so we'll consume all the hydroxide ion, that's our limiting reagent. And we're left with 0 0.005 acetic acid and 0 0.0195 of the acetate ion. Now again, if we look at the uh, henderson hasselbach equation, our pKa is 4.75 plus log base, which is the 0 0.0195 divided by 0 0.005 and that gives us a pH of 6.34. We could also ask what are the pH and pH change rate resulting from the addition of 20 milliliters of 0.1 molar nitric acid, which is a strong acid. Now the Ackham cost for this reaction is one over Ka of acetic acid. The Ka of acetic acid is very small. So the Ackham constant for this reaction is very large. Now again, we can look at initial moles, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, and for the hydrogen ion, 0 0.002. And so again, this reaction, we can consider it goes to completion. And so at equilibrium, we'll have 0 0.008 moles for the acetate ion. We've run out of the hydrogen ion, that's our limiting reagent. And we have 0 0.012 moles of acetic acid. And so we can use the henderson hasselbach equation. And so the pKa is 4.75 plus log base, which is 0 0.008 over acid, 0 0.012. And so we get that the pH after addition of the acid is 4.57. And so we saw that if we have that buffer solution, you know, if we add hydroxide, the the buffer will resist change of the pH. It goes from 4.75 to 6.34. And then if we add hydrogen ion, we go from 4.75 to 4.57. And so again, all buffers are composed of weak acid plus conjugate base. All acid base indicators are composed of weak acids plus conjugate bases that are different colors. So titrations are used to determine the concentration of an analyte. At the equivalence point, the initial concentration of adenine is equal to the concentration of a titrant added. Often it's easier to think about moles of analyte equal moles of titrant added. The pH at the equivalence point depends on the type of titration. And so if you have a strong acid, strong base titration, the pH at the equivalence point is 7, or strong base, strong acid, pH is 7. Strong acid, weak base, the pH will be less than 7. Strong base, weak acid, pH will be greater than 7. And so we can determine the endpoint of a titration by either using acid base indicator or by using a pH meter. And so the endpoint is going to be at where the inflection point is, where the slope changes, and so it's going to be around here. And so notice that probably the best choice for this titration is going to be litmus because it changes color close to the end point of that titration. Now here we're looking at a weak base titrator with a strong acid. And so our end point is a little bit different. And so I'm not sure litmus is a better choice. You know, maybe methyl orange is a better choice. And so first for the type of titration, the pH at the quince point is greater than seven. So we're titrating a weak acid. Notice your pH is starting negative um, using a strong base. And so the end point is here. And so phenolphthalein would be a good choice of indicators for this type of titration. And so phenolphthalein is a fairly popular acid base indicator. And so you can see the color as a function of pH. And so pH is seven, we have clear. And then at pH of 9.4, it starts to get a little magenta, 9.8, even more uh, darker color. And so this is the, the structure. And so you have an acid form, which is colorless. And your base form is actually that pink. And so it's kind of interesting. If you have a very acidic solution with a little phenolphthalein, then you'll have this form of the compound. 
if you have a very basic form with a little phenolphthalein, you'll have this form of the compound. And so indicators are just composed of a conjugate base of a weak acid and a conjugate base that are different colors. And so again, you can imagine that the acid is colorless and say the conjugate base is pink. And so if you have a high pH, which means not very acidic, you'll have mostly this form of the indicator and that will give you the pink color. If you have the acid form, that means you're on this side and it should be colorless. And so the base form of the indicator will be in high concentration at high pH. The acid form of the indicator will be at high concentration at low pH. And so indicators are just conjugate acid base pairs that are different colors. And so for phenolphthalein, the acid form is colorless. The base form is pink. Now, when the pH equals the pKa of the indicator, the concentration of the acid form equals the concentration of the base form. And so it should be a little bit pink. If the pH is a lot less than the pKa, then the acid form concentration is going to be greater than the base form of the concentration. And so the solution should actually be colorless. And if the pH is great, greater than the pKa, then you'll have mostly the base form. And the base form is pink. And so... So the higher the pH, the more the base form, and so the dark, darker the solution. And so again, we can understand indicators because using the Henderson Hausbach equation because they're just weak acids and conjugate bases. And so this is bromothalma blue. Its pKa is about 3.9. And so it's going to change color somewhere around here. Methyl red, its pKa is about 5. And so it changes color about there. And there's a range of um, acid base indicators because the endpoint, the pH at the endpoint depends on what weak acid you're titrating or what weak base you're titrating. Bromothymol blue indicator is yellow in acidic solution and dark purple in basic solution. This color change is reversible with a change in pH. And so the way of thinking about this diagram is here's the bromothalamol blue. If your low pH, lower than here, the solution is going to be yellow. If your pH is higher, then it's going to be blue. Now, if you're looking at methyl violet, violet, then if the pH is, you know, down here at zero, it's going to be yellow. And if it's above one, it's going to be that violet color. For the phenolphthalein, if the pH is greater than 9, it's pink. If it's lower than 8, it's going to be colorless. And that's because the base form is going to be the dominant form. Sorry, the acid form is the dominant form at low pH, and the base form is the dominant form at high pH. And so you have a, a range of indicators that have a range of pHs where, where the color changes, and this gives you the color change. And so both buffers and acid base indicators are composed of a weak acid conjugate base. And again, buffers are, are optimal when the conjugate base concentration equals the weak acid concentration. So that means when the pH equals pKa. And so when you're forming a buffer, a specific pH, you look for the weak acid with that pKa. Acid base indicators are composed of weak acid and conjugate base that are different colors. Now the color will change approximately when the concentration base equals concentration of acid or approximately when the indicator pKa is equal to the pH at the endpoint. I hope that helps.